thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I really, really appreciate your helping me celebrate the, uh, the rollout of our new book, uh, Mississippi River Tragedies, A Century of Unnatural Disaster. I wrote it with my friend Christy Klein from St. Louis, who is now a law professor at University of Florida. So she is intimately familiar with the lower river, and I am intimately familiar with the upper river and its longest tributary, the Missouri. Um, before we really launch, I want to thank the law school, and especially Rich Leiter and his daughter, Maddie, who provide us with this wonderful river delta Cajun food. I don't know if Maddie's still here, but I know Rich is there, and uh, Wendy Leiter is as well, and she was um, part of the support crew. So thank you very much for all your help with this. It's really exciting. Um, game plan is I'll talk about the book for 15 to 20 minutes. We'll take about 5 to 10 minutes of Q&A, and afterwards it will be my pleasure to autograph books or whatever else you want me to autograph. All right, so um, I've had a couple of really wonderful book reviews on the book this week, and this is just from one of them by Professor Dan Farber down at UC Berkeley, and I love the way he turns a phrase. But I don't really think of the river as an, op an opponent necessarily, nor do I think of it as infinitely patient. So let's dissect that um, as we go along. So my connection to the Mississippi River and why Christy and I wrote this book. People around here, of course, like one of my research assistants, Kane, who's wearing red, and several other of my students who are also wearing red. You might say that they bleed Husker red, but for both Christy Klein and I, it's river water that runs through our veins. In fact, the two of us met on the Colorado Rift River on a rafting trip with a whole bunch of other natural resources law professors. You might think that sounds kind of um, boring and awkward, but the two of us were two of the only of 30 or so professors that stripped off down to our swimsuits and jumped in the Colorado River. So we knew we'd be instant friends. We have that bond. I particularly love the mighty Mississippi River. The longest tributary, the Missouri, uh, was my backyard growing up, and I have a passion for the both of them. River food river music, even the smells of rivers, as funky as they may be. I grew up in Sioux City, Iowa, right on the banks of the Missouri, camping, fishing, boating on the river every weekend that my farming family could get away. I also spent many summers in and near Lake Itasca, Minnesota, at the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And it all goes back to my parents' honeymoon in 1951. There's my mom in 1951, Jessie Butler, who then became Zelmer, and a big old walleye that she had caught right out of Lake Itasca, the headwaters of the Mississippi River. She's really, really short, which makes the fish look perhaps bigger than it actually is, but it was a darn nice fish, I have to say. Then there's her some 40 years later with another darn nice walleye from another of the headwater lakes, a place called Long Lake, also in northern Minnesota, not too far from the headwaters of Itasca. Of course, when you go fishing in big lakes and big rivers as well, you need a boat. And this boat stuck with us for many, many years, much to my husband Randy's dismay. My father kept Big Blue running on spit and rubber bands for uh, as long as anybody can remember. It was finally retired just about 10 years ago, but this is how we got out there after those big old walleyes. And uh, here's Randy himself, who is here to celebrate with us as well. Uh, my father would make me clean all the bullheads and catfish I caught, but he'd never let me touch the walleye. Apparently, I was just too clumsy at filleting fish for that. Let me tell you a little bit about those Mississippi River smells. So when I was little, my mother bathed me in a garbage can filled with Mississippi River water. My students are going, oh, that explains a lot. Uh, not every night, of course, but just about every summer when my family was camping near the river's headwaters in northern Minnesota. I suppose I smelled a little fishy, but the aroma of river water was completely familiar and totally comforting to me. I savored the names of the headwater lakes where we camped, titles bestowed by Chippewa and Dakota Indians or by European explorers, Itasca, of course, but also Winnebagoshish. Andruja, Bemidji, LaSalle, 
my passion for the outdoors comes naturally, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Christy and I came to the idea for this book as we swapped childhood stories. We wanted to really look at the human relationship with rivers, particularly the Mississippi and its tributaries, over a broad time frame, about a century. One of the factors we found out really quickly is that rivers are nothing without their dirt. Sure, it's water but there's dirt as well. I didn't really know it then as a kid, but my much beloved river bottom was actually the floodplain of the Missouri River. Soils were so fertile as a direct result of frequent floods. The river periodically gushed over its banks, bringing with it rich, nourishing sediments. Another little excerpt from my family history. This is my great-grandfather, Gustav Zelmer, who arrived at the Castle Garden Immigration Depot in New York in 1883, straight off the boat as a 16-year-old wet behind the ears from Colmar, Germany. He had never, as he was riding the train out west past the Mississippi River and ultimately settling on the Missouri, he had never seen such black, fertile soils. He was awed by the gently rolling terrain, perfect for the plow. Yes, we're a farm family. The rich dirt came at a price, however. It was formed and nourished by floods, like the one in 1892, which made Gustav's house list to one side and ultimately float away from its foundation in the river bottoms near Sioux City, Iowa. The family escaped. Their baby daughter, my great aunt Henriette, was carried to safety by the town doctor, and the house itself and our farms were later moved to higher ground on the bluffs over the Missouri River. So dirt, that makes this the breadbasket of the United States. The delta and the floodplain of the river is the breadbasket because of this wonderful flood-enhanced dirt. Things have changed a little bit. Uh, my parents are no longer with us, but I still go home often to visit our families. Randy's mother still lives in Sioux City. Uh, my sister is nearby. My nephews, three of them, still farm on the bluffs overlooking the Missouri. But yes, things have changed. Dakota Dunes. How many of you are familiar with Dakota Dunes? Just outside of Sioux City, all right, a few of you are. This has sprung up on the riverbanks where we used to play and camp in, yes, I'll admit it, uh, as a teenager we had bonfires and like make out parties and keggers and stuff in the river bottoms right where Dakota Dunes now sits. Uh, yeah, Randy, it's true, I know you're not surprised. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> shocking, the nation's largest strip mall popped up down in the bottoms of St. Louis, Chesterfield Commons, built smack in the middle of the floodplain. It paved over thousands of acres of the world's best farmland. So things have changed. And the Mississippi River itself is no longer a natural river. It's really more of an unnatural construct. Here's the river. Uh, here's the basin. This is truly America's river. It drains 40% of the U.S. It includes 31 states and two Canadian provinces. It's about 2,350 miles long as it snakes its way from Lake Itasca all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Its major tributaries are, of course, the Missouri, the Ohio and the Arkansas rivers. Mark Twain, you can't have a talk about the Mississippi without mentioning Mark Twain, right? That would be malpractice. In Life on the Mississippi, he said, the Mississippi is remarkable in its disposition to make prodigious jumps by cutting through narrow necks of land. More than once, it has shortened itself 30 miles in a single jump. These cutoffs have curious effects. They have thrown several river towns into the rural districts and built up sandbars and forests in front of them. They're no longer river towns, in other words. Twain loved the river for its unpredictability. Floodplain communities and engineers, yeah, not so much. Enter the Corps of Engineers. The Corps initially confined its effort, efforts on the inland rivers to controlling the river for navigation. Around the turn of the last century, rivers were so valuable for moving grain and other commerce via navigation. But it wasn't very long before the Corps expanded its efforts into trying to tame the river in the name of flood control. So navigation first, because that's what developed first. The Corps very proudly calls this 
which is now the upper Mississippi River, some 29 pairs of locks and dams to make smooth passage for the barges, the Corps calls this handiwork a stairway of water. Quite proudly, if you look on their website, it's a stairway of water. An engineering feat, no doubt. As a result, though, it looks more like a series of slack water dammed lakes than a naturally flowing river. Downstream, the river is just as unnatural now, transformed in the name of navigation, yes, but at least as importantly to the Corps of Engineers and the communities in the name of flood control. In Twain's words, the engineers have taken upon their shoulders the job of making the Mississippi over again, a job transcended in size only by the original job of creating it. Remaking the river. We had the best of intentions. We wanted to protect people from floods. We wanted to provide commerce. We wanted to provide a transportation system. It's hard to fault the actors in history on the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Commerce leads to prosperity and safety. But it was really a grand experiment. The thing is, we didn't know what we were doing, but we had just enough technological capabilities to be dangerous ultimately to ourselves. It was a grand experiment, one large century of trial and error. We turned the Mississippi into an unnatural river and an unnatural disaster waiting to happen. Many of our legal efforts came in response to the largest floods and hurricanes in the Mississippi River floodplain. And I'll just highlight a few of these. Uh, cover, we cover all of them in the book, but let me start with the big one that kicked off much of federal flood control and policy, 1927. Some of the songs that you may have heard on our playlist, and I know we'll be playing again, thank you to Rich Leiter for that, involve and directly relate to the 1927 flood. Along came the great flood. Uh, when the Secretary of Commerce at the time, Herbert Hoover, later president, um, was going out to inspect the flood damage and to provide di disaster relief on behalf of the federal government. His train wrecked in Mississippi in 1927 because all the trestles and the bridges had been washed out. Uh, it was described in vivid detail in John Barry's Rising Tide. The experiment, though, with levees, such as they were at that time, at that early date, had proven to be a miserable failure. And it actually made the flooding worse by concentrating the fury of the floodwaters. Levees ruptured in at least 120 places. The flood caused more than 100, I'm sorry, $4.5 billion worth of damage in today's dollars. Hundreds died and hundreds of thousands were rendered homeless and placed in camps like this one, also down in Mississippi, for months at a time. At the time, critics in Congress and even the Corps described their Levy's only policy in dealing with navigation and flood control as the most colossal blunder in engineering history. And they said, quote unquote, this wasn't a natural disaster, it was a man-made disaster. We put people in harm's way. Congress responded with the Flood Control Act of 1928 and added to the levees policy a whole lot of additional flood control measures, reservations, floodways, outlets, spillways, all of which in the end, hindsight is 2020, but all of which would prove to be a poor substitute for the natural floodplains destroyed by those levees in the first place. Meanwhile, a little bit closer to home, in the 1940s and 50s, in response to additional floods, Congress authorized six massive dams on the upper Missouri for flood control, navigation, water supply, hydropower, recreation, and wildlife. It added dikes and revetments and a whole slew of other structures to tame the Missouri River as it raced down toward the Mississippi. River. Of course, this came at the expense of a lot of floodplain communities. It benefited downstream communities like Sioux City, but it came at the expense of many of the Indian tribes that had resided in the upper basin for centuries at a time. This particular picture uh, wrenches my heart every time I see it. I saw it first back in law school and it sparked my interest in dams and in river management and in Indian tribes and natural resources. This is the Secretary 
Secretary of Interior approving the condemnation of some 155,000 acres of the Fort Berthold Reservation, at the time one of the poorest places on the face of North America, uh, for Garrison Dam, as Councilman George Gillette weeps in the background. The dams couldn't stop all the flooding, though. 1952, back at my home base in Sioux City, Iowa, here's a flood from the Missouri River that swallowed up the brand uh, newly built arena and stadium. Uh, now it's the Tyson Event Center in that very spot. But you can see how the river has its own way, dams and other structures notwithstanding. 1993, moving fast forward in time, this is down in St. Louis, Chesterfield Bottoms and Boone Bridge after the Monarch Levee failed. The levee has been rebuilt since then and much of Chesterfield Bottoms is now, yes, Chesterfield Commons, commercial retail businesses in the very same place where this water once stood. Hurricane Katrina. How could a talk on the Mississippi River be complete without an excursion down to the Delta in 2005? This is a scientific visualization, uh, visualization of Hurricane Katrina and the dams, or I'm sorry, the levees and revetments that were supposed to hold the waters of the Gulf of Mexico back from the city and its vicinity. All of the man-made levees, of which there are many, are shown in pink. They didn't work and many of the levees breached and the canals overtopped. You can remember some of the most horrific scenes, and there are many of them. It was hard just to choose a few for this talk. Uh, of course, the Coliseum, um, New Orleans flooding after Katrina, and this one that struck me in 2005 when the hurricane happened. The water is rising, please. I think they might have run out of chalk. Surely they meant help, please help. So the point, oh, 2011, let's not forget 2011, um, even closer to home, this is Fort Calhoun nuclear plant close to Omaha. Again, the levees that were built weren't able to hold back the floodwaters. No levee, no dam can, faced with rivers like the Mississippi and the Missouri. Unique peril, still safe. I don't know about you, but I get a little nervous when floodwaters sweep up around a nuclear power plant. It just sort of gives me the willies. But nonetheless, we built it, and they come. And they keep coming, because we keep building levees and dikes and things that make people think they're safe, when really, they're not. Who's the most hard hit? Before we go on to some of my suggestions in terms of the lessons we've learned and reforms that we might want to adopt and wrap this up, I wanted to just pause for a minute and talk about how most of the people that are in harm's way are often those that are already most burdened by poverty and discrimination. Remember George Dillette, the Fort Berthold uh, Indian Tribal Reservation Chairman. These, of course, are refugees on the levee. All I saved was the Bible um, down in Mississippi in an earlier flood. This one is from Hurricane Katrina, a woman named Ethel Williams. George Bush, while he was president, president uh, visited her home, her hurricane-damaged home in the Upper Ninth Ward, and promised her to rebuild. Eventually they did, but it was too late for Ethel. She died of cancer just shortly after President Bush's visit, and it took another two years for her home to be completed. So there's an environmental justice chapter in the book that I think is certainly worth thinking about as we think about river management. So, the lessons. Um, we have put all of our faith in structures and also in insurance, flood insurance for floodplain residents. It hasn't really worked out too well. Many of the most risky properties still aren't insured. And disaster relief, after the fact, disaster relief. These things don't seem to be working. And we seem to be questing, hoping for a floodless floodplain. Nobody thinks it's going to happen to them. The folks in Dakota Dunes didn't think it was going to happen to them. But here are the lessons over a century of unnatural disaster. Rivers will flood. Levees will fail. An unwise flood development will happen if we let it. How do we let it? Through unwise land use planning, through very lax zoning restrictions, and through Fifth Amendment takings doctrine, which puts the fear of God into every regulator from the state, from the local to the state to the federal 
level. All these things, I think, need to be reformed. But let me just focus on one thing, and I talked about the rest of them in the book. We could talk about actually allowing a floodplain to be a floodplain. We've worked so hard to keep the river out of people's way. Maybe it's time to, at least in a few cases, get the people out of the river's way. This is not going to work everywhere. New Orleans is both an impossible city given its location below sea level, but I think it's also an inevitable city. We're not suggesting that we take over New Orleans and let the floodplain reclaim everything. Where would we get our wonderful Delta food and all that music and all that great culture? No, we're not suggesting that. But there are places where we can let the floodplain reclaim the floodplain. This happens to be a depiction of the largest floodplain restoration effort in the Mississippi, which is down in the Huicha uh, River in Louisiana. And I think if we let the rivers flood, at least in some places, perhaps we can rest a little easier. This is my dad laying on uh, the back of a small motorboat, again, close to the headwaters of the Mississippi River. It looks damned uncomfortable. But nonetheless, he found it um, very relaxing. So perhaps if we start thinking of, these, of our track record of disasters over the course of the past century, and we start thinking of them as things that humans have exacerbated, then perhaps we can start looking at some of our reform proposals with a clearer eye toward protecting people and letting the river reclaim its floodplain. All right, happy to take questions. Or just turn the music back on and eat good food and drink beer and sign books. Prof Professor Medill. We started writing the book in 2006, right after Hurricane Katrina hit. And we did a lot of research on what the scientists and hydrologists had been saying for a very long time, and that was these levees will fail. It's only a matter of time. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And that had been very well documented in a series by the National Geographic, um, in a series by some very, um, very good reporters at the Times Picayune down in New Orleans. And people nodded their head and said, yeah, but that'll never happen to me, right? And so we started unraveling and going back in time from 2005. And of course, I'd known about the 1950 floods. My parents talked about them all the time living in Sioux City. They were um, personally affected. The 1993 flood, I was living in the basin. I do remember that personally. But we kept going back and found that there had been major floods on the Mississippi or its, or its tributary about every 15 years, give or take. And the federal response, and to some extent too, the state and local response, was to continually build more structures and provide more assurances to people so that they would embrace what's really a moral hazard. Move into the floodplain and we'll protect you. And that was really eye-opening to me. I didn't initially have any sense when we started out on this project. What, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And it really is a chicken and an egg conundrum. Well, I'd like to see the latter phenomenon occur. Clearly, we have lots of engineering expertise and experience, but I think the problem is human hubris and the, 
human inclination to put our faith in technology and also to think that it will never happen to us. But there are better examples, and we've adopted a few of them in the Gulf of Mexico now after Hurricane Katrina. Think about Amsterdam. I mean, think of some of the European cities that are virtually underwater or would be if they didn't have sensible floodplain management, uh, controls on development in the floodplain. And one thing we found in Amsterdam was that the richest people also live in the floodplains. It's not just the impoverished people. So there's perhaps more of an incentive to have wise land use planning in place. I know that sounds like kind of a, a bleak response for the United States, but I'll give you an example in terms of flood insurance, the, some of the um, soft institutional tools that we've been using, non-structural tools. There was a flood, major flood insurance pre, um, reform after Hurricane Sandy, or Superstorm Sandy, spelled S-A-N-D-Y, which is not how I spell my name, just by the way. Um, there was, Congress got the fortitude in the wake of that disaster and in the fact that both Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy had bankrupt the National Flood Insurance Program. And Congress was looking some place for money to fund federally subsidized premiums and to fund disaster relief. And so it adopted reforms in 2012 to raise the premiums, to improve the floodplain maps, to um, require some of the floodplain owners to take a little bit more of the risk, particularly businesses and second homeowners, not the to try and um, ease the burden on people who were too poor to buy good flood insurance. Just a month ago, that reform was completely unraveled when people living in New York and New Jersey started complaining about how high their insurance premiums had gone. And Congress immediately went running back and stripped away all the reforms that it had adopted. So it's, uh, it's a real political football. And everyone wants to be seen like George Bush. They're handing out the disaster relief and hope and optimism. No one wants to be seen as adopting the tough reforms in advance of the next disaster. All right, well, let's, uh, let's have some fun. I am going to be here. I'll be signing. And uh, we'll let the music commence and there's still beverages. I know we have plenty for everyone and there's lots of goodies left. So thank you all for coming.